Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. PDP. 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 Glory and honor and praise be unto him that is high and lifted up, that is more than able. Glory and honor be unto who he who created the entire universe by the power of his word. Glory and honor be unto him who has kept us safe and who has established his counsel in this world and indeed in this nation. Glory, praise and honor unto him who determines the future, who establishes the present and who looks back into the past. I give him glory and I give him praise. I thank him for this wonderful occasion. I thank him for these wonderful people, our leaders, and all that are gathered here. I thank him for the resilience and the strength of the people of Plateau State and the Middle Belt. I thank him for our nation, Nigeria. Most important of all, I thank him for life, for peace, for joy, that he shall bestow upon our nation, regardless of that which the enemy has set in motion. Glory and honor and praise be unto him, because he alone keeps us safe, and he alone grants us victory over our collective enemies. For those of you who have lost so many in this state over the years, at the hands of the marauders, I say let, your, let the peace of the Lord comfort you, and let the glory of the Lord be upon you. For it is in him that your hope lies, not in any political party, not in any leader, not in any individual, not in anything other than him, his power, his strength, for this is his state, this is his nation, this is his world. And I honor him before anything else today, and I give him the glory. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to first of all acknowledge the fact that I am delighted to be here. I'm humbled to have been invited. And I'm delighted at the fact that I'm here sharing a platform with my big brother, friend, and somebody that I have considered and I've taken as a father to me, and that is Senator Jonah David Jang. who is a great inspiration and who over the years has taught me and so many in my generation so much about the challenges of the Middle Belt and indeed of this nation. In him you have a great treasure and I'm glad to see the way in which you have spoken of him and addressed him here today because he deserves this honor and he has been a great man, a great ambassador, a great father to this community and indeed to Nigeria. So it's an honor for me to be here, sir. It is an honor that I am sharing a platform with you. I also wish to acknowledge another big brother who is ably represented here and who is running for the governorship of this state, that's General, General Luseni, a man that I've come to know over the years and another great son of the plateau. And I know that by the grace of God, he will be the next governor of this state. I wish to thank my brother, Musa, for inviting me here today and his group. I thank you very much. I hope you know what you put yourself into <laughs> by inviting me here because I, I, I do not intend to pull any punches. And I think that's as it should be. And I think that uh, the people of this great state deserve nothing but the truth. And today I will try my best to convey that truth to them. I wish you the very best in your election, and I know that you will do very well, because none can do better than you. I wish to also acknowledge the presence of our senatorial candidate for this region, and I know that you will get there, God will guide you, and once you've been elected, God will give you the strength and the courage and the fortitude to build on the great foundation and legacy of our father, of Najayim. Now, permit me to stand on all protocols and then permit me to get to the point. I have been asked to come and say a few words about 
the importance of defending our votes uh, in order to sustain democracy and also to find a way to ensure that the next generation flourishes and has a place in this contraction called Nigeria. Now, I have to start by saying this. I will not speak as a politician because politicians tend to be careful in what they say and they tend to always wish to be politically correct. I believe that it's important to always speak the truth and to cut the chase and ensure that those truths contend with the evil in our land. I believe that the only way that you can take on falsehood and evil and tyranny and to confront them frontally is with the sword of truth. And therefore, those truths must be spoken, no matter how uncomfortable they may appear. Especially where you believe there is what we will call an existential threat. Existential threat to our people, our faith, our nationality in terms of ethnicity, ethnic nationality, our survival, and also our self-respect and dignity. More than any other state in the Federation, Plateau State has suffered in the hands of those that I believe have an agenda to subjugate your people. You have suffered. And it is painful for me to say that that suffering that you have suffered has spread like a cancer throughout the whole of the Middle Belt and throughout the whole of the Federation. Many Nigerian people felt that it was okay if it happened in Plateau State alone. When they killed your people, took your farms, took your homes, raped your women, slaughtered you in the street, burnt your churches, stripped your clerics bare, stripped them naked, insulted your faith, and took everything from you. Many in Nigeria, most, Nigerians said, well, it's okay, it doesn't affect us. Complicated issue in Plateau State. We're not interested. And of course, when you stood your ground and fought back, many said, that's not very good. We don't like violence. We don't want people to defend themselves. Forget it, that you were the victims of an earlier aggression or you had the right to defend yourself. That has been the contradiction in the history of our country. This strange belief that some are entitled to commit violence, gratuitous violence, and some are entitled to commit genocide, mass murder, ethnic cleansing, whilst others have no right to defend themselves. That is the Nigerian experience. Unfortunately for Nigeria, the cancer spread. Because you see, you suffered it long before even the creation of Nigeria. Then you suffered it again after Nigeria was created. But its most profound expression, in my view, came probably just before and during the Nigerian Civil War, when another nationality in this country suffered a similar fate, a fate they had never suffered before. But they suffered it in the hands of all of us, collectively, driven by those that once killed and are still killing your people. That is the reality. And what happened? I won't go into it in depth, but I'll just mention it. 100,000 people slaughtered in the north in Kanu, Kaduna, because they were Igbos. That was in 1966, by the usual suspects. Of course, it was provoked. Series of coups, first coup, second coup. But the civilians had nothing to do with coup planning. 100,000, 100,000, in the space of three months, in the corner, slaughtered. 
pregnant women cut open, children taken out, and their heads dashed against the walls. Didn't stop there. Then came a brutal civil war. When those people, the Igbo people, said enough is enough, we want to go. We said no. Stay within. Stay within. And there was a civil war. Within that war, three million people died. One million of them children starved to death in the name of one Nigeria. This was a very heavy price to pay for our unity. And that price was paid. And we said, okay, fine. We've paid the price. Let's stay together as one. And we didn't look back. But sadly, those that perpetuate, commit, encourage and orchestrate these killings did not stop there. Throughout our history, I won't go through every example, it will take too long. It will take too long. Throughout our history, since the end of the Civil War, the story has been the same. If it is not back to Plateau, if it is not Southern Kaduna, if it is not Benue State, if it is not Adamawa State, if it is not anywhere else in that, it is somewhere else. People being slaughtered, people being killed, butchered in their homes, their land taken, their churches burnt, their people disgraced and insulted. And they say none should complain because when you complain, they say it's hate speech. They forgot about the little girl whose throat was cut, whose blood was drained, and who was thrown in the well. They forgot about the cleric, the priest, who was preaching at his altar, and they came, they took him out, cut his throat, slaughtered him as if he was a ram, and they burnt his church. They forgot about all those people and said nobody should complain. Yet Nigeria continued. And what happened? You had the first Mahdi, and I'm sorry to say this, but I have to say it. Because what's the point of coming all this way to simply indulge in rhetoric, which is all too familiar, and act as if all is well. Nothing is well. It is not well. And I'm coming to be sure of Buhari in the election at the moment. The first Mahdi, a man by the name of Usman Danfodio, to some a great scholar, to others a man that has committed more genocide than any other leader in the history of Africa. That is a historical fact. A man that spread his faith by the sword and who slaughtered many because they refused to accept his faith. And he imposed that faith by the power of violence. Many died under his sword and he established the Caliphate in 1804. Many forget that there were kingdoms in this part of the country and in this part of the world long before that time. But he imposed his will, established the Caliphate, established Fulani Emirs, and that's where we are up until today. Conquered the North, as far as they were concerned. The people of the North are a conquered people, conquered by internal colonialists, who came to impose their will, impose their faith, impose their ethnicity on the rest of the North. That was his mission, and he managed to achieve it. Next came the one I would describe as the second Mahdi. His name was Sir Amadou Bello, and he was the premier of the old northern region. To some, a great man who tolerated so much, so, so much and who was prepared to accept all. But to others, and this needs to be carefully understood, to others, a man who must be taken by his word when he said in 1960 that his mission was to dip the Quran in the Atlantic Ocean. In other words, conquer the South just as his great-grandfather had conquered the North. That was his mission. And my goodness, he tried very hard to achieve that. 
He was the second Mahdi. And of course, it was under him that so much happened. And after he was killed, and sadly I might add, because I don't relish or take pleasure in anybody's death, not even an animal's death. I don't believe in killing people. And nothing here should be construed as, you know, to mean that I'm encouraging violence or inciting violence. I'm simply going through each step historically in order to educate and enlighten. Because that's important. That's what empowers us. So he did his bit. And of course, he tried his best to further that agenda. The Fulani agenda and the Islamic agenda. And his time came and his time went. After him came a man that I would describe as the most dangerous, the most reprehensible, the most committed, the most focused, the most ruthless, and the most diabolical of them all. A man that I've often described as the third Mahdi. And that man's name is Muhammad Buhari. What could have happened to this man? A man that led our soldiers so gallantly in charge when we had a war there. A man that was revered by his troops and loved by so many. A man that was once regarded as being incorruptible in so many ways. A man that was seen as being a good Muslim, a strong man, and a tolerant believer. Something changed. Or is it that we never really knew him? But the Buhari that took power in 2015, nay, the Buhari that sought for power since the year 2003 was different to the Buhari of before. The Buhari that sought for power in 2003 said earlier in 2001, and I want you to listen to this very carefully. It's been said many times, never been refuted. He said in 2001 that Muslims should only vote for Muslims. He said in 2001 that why should Christians be bothered when Muslims chop off their arms? After all, these are Muslim limbs that are being chopped off in the name of Sharia, not Christian ones. So why should they be bothered? This is a man who said in 2001, came down to Ibadan, and told Governor Lamadishino, the late Governor Lamadishino, after there was a fight, there was a communal strike between Fulani herdsmen and the local Yoruba population, local farmers, said to him that, why are your people talking about the Yoruba people, killing my people, talking about the Fulani herdsmen? That was in 2001. This is a man who said, in 2013, just a few years ago, that an attack on Boko Haram is an attack on the north. This is a man who was nominated in 2014 to be the representative and the spokesman and chief negotiator of Boko Haram in proposed talks with the federal government of that day. This is a man who Boko Haram said they trusted and that they loved. What happened to him? How did he degenerate in this level? This is a man who has openly professed his love for Fulani herdsmen, those that go all over the country, not just the Middle Belt, not just the North, but even the South, killing, maiming, torturing, butchering, hacking, removing the eyes of people, removing their limbs, their hearts, taking their homes in Plateau State alone. They came a few months back. I don't need to tell you, you know better than me. They killed, they took the land, and they renamed the communities. Those towns and villages they took, they didn't just take them, they renamed them and gave them alien names in an indigenous community like this. This is what they did. And yet, Buhari professes his love for them. This is a man whose soldiers slaughtered over 1,000 Shia Muslims in 2016 in Kaduna, in Zaria. This is a man that since that time, 
His security force have slaughtered many Shia Muslims. This is a man whose security forces have killed so many IPOB youths simply because they said they want self-determination or referendum. Many thousands slaughtered, slaughtered all over the country, detained and locked up, suppressed and declared terrorists. That is what Buhari has done. And yet this is a man who up until today has refused to describe Meyeti Allah all the Fulani herdsmen as terrorists. One has to ask why. One has to ask why. We talk about his record in office and I laugh when some commend him and say he has done well. The other day I was told that the Vice President's mother got up and said that those that have not seen what Buhari and her son have done are clearly not seen clearly. My response to her is this, and I have respect for mothers any day, anywhere. And I still respect her because she's a mother, and I'm sure she's a wonderful woman. But the truth is this, her son, together with his boss, are not just mass murderers, not just ethnic cleansers. They're not just everything reprehensible under the sun. Genocidal maniacs, and I say this because I remember and I see the blood that was shed. I see that blood. And I say it is wrong enough there to look away and to say it never happened. 2016 Christmas, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, 808 people were slaughtered in their homes. 808. Defenseless, innocent men, women and children by Fulani herdsmen. Who having never offered an apology for not protecting them. And we fire appeared to relish the whole thing and indeed closed down the hospital where Christians were being treated. A Christian community, they were slaughtered. And you tell me that that is a good record. You tell me that. I say no. That is a disgraceful record. And they will end up by the grace of God in the international court at the Hague for crimes against humanity and for the wickedness they have indulged in. We continue to look at the situation in our country. And let's look at it closely. Then I'll get to the point. For the first time in our history, we have a situation whereby the president of the Federal Republic is a Northern Muslim. The president of the Senate is a Northern Muslim. The chief judge, acting chief judge of the Federation, is a Northern Muslim. All the security chiefs in this country, there are 17 security organizations in this country. Every single one of them, and, and wings of the military, every single one of them that have operational command, except for the Navy, are in the hands of Northern Muslims. It gets worse. A situation whereby the CJ is a Northern Muslim. The President of the Court of Appeal is a Northern Muslim. The President of the Federal High Court is a Northern Muslim. The Chairman of INEC is a Northern Muslim. The Chairman of the National Population Commission is a Northern Muslim. Every key appointment that has been made by Buhari in the last few months and years are those of Northern Muslims. And I ask this question, is this how a federation is meant to be? No way. Was this what we agreed on at the outset for a greater Nigeria? I have nothing against Muslims. Absolutely nothing. There are Muslims in my mother's family. She used to be a Muslim, she converted. I have nothing against Muslims. But what I have against what some of them do is this idea that one religion must supersede another and the will of one must be imposed upon another. This I cannot accept as a Christian and I will never accept. If this country, and I say this, I choose my words carefully, regardless of who is listening, regardless of who will be reported where, I will say it any day, any time. If this country does not insist and ensure that Muslims and Christians are equal power, or equals, and that Northerners 
and southerners are not all equal and that you no longer have horse and horse rider or master and slave or servant and master if we do not have a country where all are equal before God then I say and I'll say any day anywhere let there be no country at all We love Nigeria, we believe in Nigeria, but only if Nigeria has a place for us all. Then you look at the utterances of some of them. My friend in Kaduna State, because it's obvious what they are planning to do in a few days time. Buhari has no intention of going, and I'm coming to that in a moment. We'll go into the issue of the election in a moment. He has no intention of going. And if he does, and he concedes defeat, because if it's a free and fair election today, Atiku will win and defeat him hands down. That is it. But make no mistake about it. He doesn't want to go. And the only thing left for him to do is to rape. And as somebody wrote this morning, it is not the APC of Buhari that Atiku and the PDP are up against. It is primarily INEC and the security agencies and all those that are planning to bring Buhari back into power. Now, let me say this. We all need to be very careful when it gets to a point that somebody like Nasser al Rufai in Kaduna State, again, a man that I thought I knew, we used to be very close when we were in cabinet together, but can get up and say that the international community that have expressed so much concern about Buhari's intentions to rape, that if any of them comes here and complains and does what he calls interfering, in other words, complains about rigging, that's what he means. We're going to rape if you come and complain about it, that they will leave this country in body bags. I, I want you to stop and think about the implications. Are we okay? About the implications of that statement. Body bags. Body bags. In other words, we have decided to kill anybody that stands in our way. Well, that's nothing new. They've been doing it for so long anyway. The new dimension is this. They have threatened the Americans. They've threatened the British. They've threatened the Europeans. And they've threatened the entire world. That is the difference today. And that tells you something. When the same man in his state, a state which in my view, probably has a majority, a Christian majority. But let's even agree that it's 50-50. You now get up and say that you will not pick a running mate that is a Christian. You pick a running mate that is a Muslim. You yourself, you're a Muslim. You have a Muslim-Muslim ticket in a state that's predominantly Christian. This tells you something about the agenda. And I'll say this again. These are very dangerous moves. These are very dangerous moves. And I urge those of you that may know Nasser or are close to him or have access to him to tell him to tread with caution. Because you must never, ever, ever take the restraint that our Lord and Savior has bestowed upon us and encouraged us to indulge in. Don't mistake that restraint, sense of responsibility and decency and, and, and you know, that, that idea that we just don't like to shed blood. Don't take it as weakness. Don't take it as weakness. Christians are not weak. Neither can we be intimidated. Neither can we be destroyed. The church was built on the blood of the saints and the bones of the martyrs. Our Lord himself was sacrificed and he shed his blood on the cross. And the church was born that way and went from strength to strength. The more of us that you kill, the more body bags that you prepare, the more of us that you intimidate, the more of us that you, you shame and you take everything from, the stronger we become. And I look at a good example when I talk about the people in the middle world, I look at you. Many of you may not know what they took from you. But the truth is this. They took virtually everything from you. 
apart from your self-respect and dignity. They took virtually everything else from you. They took your language and imposed another on you. They imposed their traditional rulers on you. In many ways, they imposed their faith on you. Many of you don't even know your own great history. You only know the history post the conquest of Damfodium. And I want to urge you to know who you are, remember who you are, remember what you are, and let them not take that away from you. Now, coming to this election, I've said it already, what their plan is. But what can we do in order to thwart it? There is only one thing we can do. One, we emphasize on the power and the beauty of unity of purpose. That is between moderate Muslims, Muslims, the true Muslims, who believe in God and who love their fellow Christians and who love anybody that has the same blood flowing through their veins and is also a human being. That is a true Muslim. And then you look at the true Christians who also share that vision, who want nothing but fellowship and, 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 and a good relationship with others. It is for those two groups to come together and to stand against those that I would declare and describe as the Islamists in our midst. The Islamist is not a Muslim. The Islamist is a Muslim fundamentalist. If there were Christian fundamentalists in this country, I would stand against them as well. I do not believe in the imposition of your faith in others. But in order to ensure that we win this election, we must come together with all men of goodwill and women of goodwill and say no to those that have this hegemonist Islamic agenda to impose their will on us because that's what Buhari stands for. What Buhari wants to do is to enslave every single Nigerian. What Buhari has managed to achieve is to actually enslave a good portion of Nigerians. Enslave the mind, enslave in the psyche, enslave to a point that many of our own people literally worship those that are present. They worship. And of course, the most despicable type of Christian or Southerner is those that I would describe with an accursed slave and a useful idiot. I've written about it many times. Somebody that has no self-esteem, that will bow before the oppressor, that will willingly give the head of his mother to the oppressor, that will rape his own daughter for the oppressor, that will kill his own father for the oppressor, that will sell his future, sell his heritage, sell his people for nothing, all just to be able to have a few crumbs from the oppressor's table. And there are many like that. And I'm going to say something today, and I hope that you will not find this offensive. I say it from a position of love. And I say it because I trust that it can be changed. But there are many who have supported Buhari in this state, and indeed throughout this country, who belong to that category. You must understand that Buhari is not your friend. Buhari is not your friend. Buhari is your color. Buhari is your oppressor. And Buhari is your tyrant. And I'm sending a message to the governor of this state, Lalo, that he should please retrace his steps and do the best for his people. The people of Plateau State are men of honor and women of honor. They are proud people with a historical tradition second to none. We remember the Lantan Mafia. We remember all the good men and women of this part of the country. Great men that have done so much. Men like Paul Kindery and so many others. We remember them. We've heard about them. We go to the right and the left. Men like Solomon La. Men like J.F. Taka. So many of them. Men like Jack that is sitting here today. So many. And I, men like Johnny Tanko Yusuf. You see, I know your history. And it pains me when you have a man like my Lord who will come here and tell you to vote for your oppressor and support your oppressor in the name of party politics. This is unacceptable. I say to him, thus I'm here on platform soil, on the soil of his mother and his father. Retrieve your steps. Get away from these people that have nothing good to say about
by your people. You can have nothing good to say by your faith. Remember who you are. Remember what you are. And retrace your steps before it is too late. Another four years, God forbid, of this tyranny. Amen. And Nigeria will never be the same again. In fact, let me tell you this. If this man comes back, God forbid. I'm telling you, and remember this, because in 2015, when I told the world about what Buhari stood for, particularly when I was running the campaign, many within PDP criticized me for until today. They said, oh, you shouldn't have said that, don't say this, don't say that. You shouldn't have said this. Yet everything that I said has come to pass. Now let me tell you what I'm going to tell you today. If Buhari comes back, God forbid, after four years, there will no longer be a Nigeria. I'm telling you. I can sense it. I can feel it. You know why? Because there are many that are behind us. People like myself and so many in my generation are bridge builders. We believe in unity. We believe in peace. We believe in love. We don't want division. We don't want, want war. We don't want strife. We deplore violence. But there are many behind us in the new rising generation who don't have time for this. And who are saying, you have enjoyed your time. We wish to enjoy ours and our future. And our future cannot possibly lie as long as we are treated as slaves. And who can blame them? They will not stand by and watch the country be this for mine. They will not stand by and watch silently as Fulanis are putting everything to keep position in this country. They will not stand by and allow Fulani MS to be put all over the middle belt and in the south. They will not stand by and allow their father's land to be handed over to cattle herders and so on and so forth. They will not stand by and take all this. And the resistance is building by the day. And I'm saying, in order to achieve unity and peace, we must reject it. And we must go for somebody that is moderate, that is modern, that is not a hegemonist, that is not an Islamic fundamentalist, that believes in unity and peace of this country, and believes that all Nigerians are one. And that person is Abu Bakr Atifu. Now, let me end with just a few words concerning the importance of defending our votes and defending the mandate that will come. I want to say to you that this is probably going to be the most important single thing that you will do probably for your whole life, for all our lives, and for the sake of your family and your loved ones. We must not allow them to steal the election next Saturday. We must not allow them to deprive us or to deny us of what we know is ours. In 2015, we let it go. And the story still hasn't been told. But that story will be told one day. The story has many facets and many faces. But let me just say this part of it to you. In Kanu State, where according to Jega and his team, every single vote was cast. Nobody abstained. Nobody was absent. They were all cast in Kanu State. When it became clear that this was an ungodly act, and the resident electoral commissioner of Kanu got cold feet and started speaking out and threatened to expose the fraud, he was burnt alive with his entire family in his bedroom and in his room. That tells you something. That story and many other stories have not been told. This time round, they are planning all sorts. But by the grace and the power of God, by the power of his word, he that is high and lifted up, who straight fills the temple, and who cannot be defeated in battle. Let me tell you this. Whether he rigs it or not, Buhari will not remain in power for the next four years. I say this, I say this to you prophetically. Whether he's declared winner or not, if he rigs it and he's declared winner, it will be a short-lived experience. Why? Because God is involved. God is in control. God is with us. I also have to honor a man 
before I leave this uh, podium, who was misunderstood by many, and who is the son of the middle belt, and who fought the cause of the middle belt in southern Nigeria, and who I must say that the issues he raised at the time, which many didn't see, and he died for it, he raised certain issues, and he was killed for it. And I want to honor him today. And that man's name is Major Gideon Orca. He is a man that you as middle Belgians should be proud of. Not because you believed that it was right for him to do a coup or kill anybody, not because of that. But because of the very idea that, and this was in 1991, years ago, that he believed that it was time for the true emancipation of the middle belt. The middle belt are the teeth of the north. You are the strength of the north. Without you, without men like General T.Y. Danjima and so many others who are from the middle belt, this country would not still be as it is today. It wouldn't even be won. We wouldn't have won the Civil War. You made it happen. You are the strength and the pride of the north. You are not slaves. You are not to be used and dumped. You're not to be coward, you're not to be coward, you're not to be intimidated. You ask somebody, please remember this, because in the coming Nigeria, the new Nigeria that's emerging, you're going to play a very key role. We're not going to break up as a nation by God's way. Why won't we break us up? We shall remain together. It is those that have come all the way from Futajalu that insist on imposing their will on us. If they do not insist, that is, that is when they'll be trouble. And let me tell you, we won't break up. They will go back to where they came from, or they will live with the rest of us in peace. It's as so simple as that. I urge you strongly to appreciate the importance of voting, of defending your votes. But I also urge you to remember this. That is just the first chapter of this book. This election will come and go. The challenges that we are facing will still remain. And if our people comes into power, he must address those challenges. If Atiku does not address those challenges, I, Femi Fadikayone, will be the first to lead Panga against him. I will do so willingly because it is important that we don't just win an election. We must ensure that one, this country is restructured. We must ensure that two, every Nigeria is given pride and place in the streets of the people. We must ensure that there is no full army hegemony anymore. We must ensure that there is no religious hegemony anymore. And we must ensure that no matter where you come from in this country, no matter who you are, no matter where you were born, that we are treated as equals. That is the challenge. That is the target. That is the objective. And by God's grace, that is what we shall achieve on Saturday and from there on. Now I commit you to the hands of God. I commit our leaders into the hands of God. I commit our people into the hands of God. I commit our nation into the hands of God. I pray for peace in this nation. I pray for victory for our people. I pray for victory for our faith. I pray and I declare that no weapon fashion against us shall prosper. I pray that every tongue that rises against us stands condemned. I pray and I declare that the Lord is our light and our salvation. And our shall not be fear. No one will conquer us. No one will overcome us. We have no sense of fear. We have no fear in us because we are believers. We are champions. We are champions. And we shall prevail in the name of the Most High God. They should do what they like. And rest as big as they can. They try to get into the kind of prison now. And rest us all. Not us all love. Contain us all. It doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, that blood that was shed at Calvary 2,000 years ago speaks for us. And if you take the death day down, there are thousands behind him, millions behind him that will rise up. If you take down Jonah Jai, there are millions behind him. Our hope is in you, the younger one, to fly the flag, fight the battle, stay strong, stay focused, and never, never let them take the fight against you alone. This is one of the